Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great joy to welcome you all here this morning on this beautiful summer's day. I hope you don't feel too discombobulated having changed the seating around. It just makes it easier for people to access uh, the whole of the church in different ways. I hope uh, that works for you. We're... <laughs> no, it's all right, Ian. Yeah, we're okay. You don't like it. Oh, I'm really sorry. We'll, we'll see what we can do for next week then. We'll do it just as you want it to be. We're going to, uh, just to bring to people's attention, a couple of things that are going on this week, a really significant week for us in lots of ways. Great opportunities for families at Messy Church on Thursday up at All Saints, half past three kickoff, and wonderful activities for people, especially with the children, families to get together and build relationships and hear and celebrate the good news of Jesus. Secondly, there is an opportunity to come to a really special concert here, where the Serenata Singers at seven o'clock and the, on Saturday evening. And this is a, a sponsored by or in, in aid of Christians Against Poverty. Our, and I do hope as many of, as possible will able to, be able to come. I'm sure it's going to be an excellent concert all around. And if you follow the links um, on the website, you'll be able to get tickets as well for that. And finally, the ladies' breakfast on that Saturday morning at nine o'clock at St. Andrew's Hall here an opportunity to get together, especially if you're new to the church. It's a great way of building relationships with other women of our church family. Secondly, it's a real privilege to be able to call the bands of marriage. Um, between a couple whose parents are probably well known to you. I just wonder whether Jenny and... Uh, and uh, Jerry and Becca, Jeremy and, and Becca are here. Are they Jeremy and Becca here this morning? No. no? Okay. They, Jeremy and Becca are the parents of, of Kay, who's getting married to Thomas. So it's a real pleasure to call the bands of marriage between Thomas, George, Dryden, Wright, uh, of St. Andrews, in, and St. Patrick in Elverdon, and Catherine Elizabeth Baxter of St. Andrews here, this in this parish. If any of you knows any reason in law why these two people may not be joined together in holy matrimony, you are to declare it. And this is for the first time of asking. Let's stand together. <clears throat> the Lord is here. Spirit Let's spend a moment reflecting on those awesome words. The Lord Jesus is present with us by his spirit. There's a few seats at the front. I wonder if he's sitting with us in one of those seats. His spirit is filling this place and his love permeates our hearts and flows into the whole world. Let's just close our eyes for a moment and be still. Know that the Lord is with us now in his mercy, his desire to come and bring healing, his desire to meet us where we are and love us as we are. Thank you, Lord, that you are here for us and we are here for you. Come, Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. We want all our whole selves to be focused on you, to be caught up with your wonder, your awesome might, your gentle love, and your encouraging words to us today. So if the children 
anybody would like to come forward and take a flag and just wave it quietly and slowly you can take it back to your places or stand at the front use some instruments to worship God together please do that now let's sing we are here for you Lord among us, for you've promised that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in the midst. And Lord, there's a lot more than two or three of us. Lord, we praise you for your presence, and we pray that you'd lead us deeper into your word and your spirit's life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please do be seated. It's really great to have uh, Rich Johnson with us this morning as well, who's the, uh, the vicar at All Saints in Worcester, and it's, uh, he's going to be preaching later in our service uh, on the, some of these words by Habakkuk, in the book of Habakkuk. The prophet writes, I stand in awe of your deeds. He's praying to the God, and he's in the presence of this God, and he's thinking about the 
nature of God and how much God has done over the years and down the centuries. And I stand in awe of your deeds. I wonder what deeds and things that we stand in awe of in our everyday lives. Sometimes things just strike you and you think, gosh, how amazing that is. The wow moments that we sometimes encounter. Well, I had a bit of a wow moment when I was in France last year when I went to Spring Harvest with my wife and uh, we were walking in a, a, a village in the, in the north of France called Les Sables d'Olonne. It's a beautiful place. Well, some of you have been there probably. And we came across this wall that was full of these shell pictures. People had used shells to decorate this wall with amazing creative imagination. What sort of creature have we got here in shells, do you think? Put your hands up if you know which one it is. Shout it out. Yeah, octopus. Yeah, let's see if octopus a little bit closer. There he is, and you can see now <laughs> that he's made up of all these whelks and different, I don't know all these shells very well, but they're beautiful. And not only the octopus was like that, on the wall, lower down, if you notice in the first picture, there's a crab and all sorts of other things made out of shells. There he is. You see how it's all made? And you can see the pavement. It goes throughout the whole of this level of, different, uh, of, of a small road. And I was amazed, partly because of the incredible range of shells that were there, but also that God had given the person or the people who'd done this such a gift of creativity and imagination. And I thought, wow, God, this is just brightening up and filling me with joy. Thank you for what you've done. Now, I stand in awe of your deeds. I wonder whether we could spend a moment as a whole church here just sharing one or two things that you have stand in awe of, things that you feel are wow about God and what he's done. Have a think for a moment of one thing. It may be something that you've seen in creation. It may be something that you've noticed in another person. It may be something that you've read in the Bible that God has done in, in the past. It may be something that God has done since the Bible was written, centuries ago. But something that you, for you is amazing and wonderful and you stand in awe of. Just have a moment to think about one thing. Okay, and now we're going to invite people, as we're going to stand in awe, we're going to ask you to stand and turn to the people near you, just in fours or fives, and one or two people, if you'd be brave enough to share with another person in that little group. If you don't want to share it, that's fine. Just one or two people to share the thing that you're thinking of. So if you'd like to stand now, turn to the people near you, and share one thing with your group. Stand now, and we'll see you able to do that.
Okay, if you can bring your stories of awe to a close for a minute, and then you can sit down again, that would be great. And Sean is going to just to come round to one or two people who might be willing to share something of what they've heard. That they probably think, wow, how amazing God is. Not so much how incredible that was, but we stand in awe of God and what he's done. So Sean, if you're happy, if you're happy to share, put your hand up and we'd love to do Charlotte. that. Charlotte. Start with that group, yeah, yeah, that's great. The gift of children. Hang on a second, we just need to, to go on. Is it one, Peter? Yeah. The, gi the gift of children. The gift of children. The gift of children, wow. Yeah. She's got an amazing more awesome one. more awesome than that, yeah. <laughs> or terrifying, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to see? Here we are, this part. Hang on a second, Sean, I'm just coming with your microphone. I love to see Ian raising his hands and singing with joy. That is awesome. Yeah, so you are, yeah. Ian. Fantastic. Well done, Ian. That's an awesome thing. A couple more. Thank you, Sarah. Um, how many millions of people there are on this planet and that God is interested in me and the tiny little things that are going on in my yeah. life? I just find that mind-blowing. Yeah, mind-blowing. Did you get that? Just... How can it be all these people and all the world that God sees and it's just me that he's focusing on? Yeah, that's really special. One more. One of the children, perhaps. Can, there we are. How God made the mountain so big. How yeah. did he make the mountain so big? Yes. Oh, because God is so big, so strong and so mighty. <laughs> he has made some big mountains. Thank you all very, very much indeed. That's brilliant. No, I don't need that. You can take it back. Thanks, Sean. Lovely. Well, I'm just going to ask you to stand again, and we're going to pray for the children. We've thought this morning, Lord, of how awesome the gift of children <coughs> is, and how you, by a miracle of birth, Make that possible. We ask for your blessing. May they know that they, each one of them, are special to you. You see us as we are and love us individually and personally. We pray that as the children and young people go to their groups, they may know they walk with you and always will. In Jesus' name, amen. So please do move to your groups and uh, the rest of you can turn to each other and carry on any conversations that I cut short. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's be still before God and remind ourselves why we are gathering this morning. There will be many reasons why you decided to, to come, but let's focus on the central reason. Lord, as your family, we gather here today, not because we have to, but because we want to. We are here to offer you our worship, our prayers, and our lives in service to you and to our neighbor. We have as our example your son, who chose not to rule but to serve, who gave of himself and you a love so strong that it flowed like a river from his hands and his heart. Your son, who came that we might have life, 
and have it abundantly. Thanks be to God, your Son who came that we might know love and knowing might share. Thanks be to God, your Son who emptied himself of life and love that we might be filled with both. Thanks be to God. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. So as God's children, let us come before our Heavenly Father, open and ready to be honest with God and to receive the grace of his forgiving love. So confessing our sins, we seek forgiveness. Father, we come here today conscious of our shortcomings, aware of the thoughts, actions, and deeds which have not reflected your love. Jesus, Lord of love, have mercy on us. Father, our lives are filled with comings and goings, so little time to be still and to notice what you are doing. So little time for others, for giving instead of receiving. Lord Jesus, Lord of life, have mercy on us. Father, in a world that needs to know your love, forgive us those times when impatience Tiredness, selfishness, or insecurity have made it difficult for others to see your love through our lives. Jesus, servant of all, have mercy on us. The prophet Habakkuk said, Lord, in your anger, remember mercy. And he does. So may God in his mercy forgive us, draw close to us, embrace us once again in his loving arms and enable us to follow him in worship and grateful service. Amen. Okay. Let's stand to worship the Lord, the great God who is worthy of all our praise.
the musicians just continue to play in the background, we want to allow God to touch our spirits. And if you feel you want to sing or speak, use the gift of tongues if that's where you've been blessed. Just allow the, the spirit to, to break through your inhibitions and just allow God's praise to be heard among the people. Let's do that now as God comes among us afresh. Thank you, Lord. Just cry out to him in prayer and praise and adoration and song. Just humming music, allowing the spirit to flow. Thank you, Lord. We adore you. We give you our prayer. to your word and your spirit as we pray for our nation, as we pray for our world, as we pray for ourselves and intercede for those in particular Lord Jesus. May we pray in your will and through you to the Father. Let's come to God now in intercessory prayer as Joan leads us. Lord, we bring before you the needs of the world. And sometimes we can be overwhelmed by what we see. But Lord, we pray for governments and for rulers with power and authority that they would have wisdom and mercy. And we pray that you'd hold back the power that cares little for others. Defend and protect the weak and the innocent caught up in war or disaster. And we lift to you Christians who are working in these areas, serving and caring. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. There are many changes in the world today. And for the last few weeks, we've been praying for about 16 or so of our young people who've been doing O-levels, A-levels, university finals, and they are, have been working so hard. And Lord, we lift them to you, their families, their teachers who support and encourage them. May they know that you will be with them on the next stage of the journey, whatever that may be. 
and there are older people too in the congregation who are doing further training or they're changing jobs and looking to a new area. Lord, be with them as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. There's change also at Little Subwell. There's a new manager in the cafe, bookshop and counselling centre in the middle of Malvern. We pray for Simon and Sheila and their new leadership. We pray that you'd send more volunteers for that. And just thank you so much, Father, for the opportunity to reach out to people in this area here through that work. And there's change too with new housing going up, not just here, but on the north side of Morven as well. People are moving in to a new life, to make new friends, maybe to start a new job. It's change. And we think of the Alpha Group too, as they share the ideas and the meaning of life with Colin and the team. Lord, may you guide and direct their thinking as they move forward. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. There will be a big change in the Priory Church next week, the week after this one. There will be 600 junior school children coming in to experience life as being a Benedictine monk. They'll have activities, songs, sketches and times of prayer and they will be thinking about their life's path ahead. And we pray for those ecumenical leaders and helpers who will be there guiding and directing them, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we continue to pray for Dave on that sabbatical and pray that you'd refresh him in body, mind and spirit and that he would know your presence each day. Father, we thank you for those who need you at the moment and we lift them to you. Those with concerns for their health and well-being and their family members, people on the prayer chain or just know those that we know personally. We pray for those who are caring for them at home or maybe in the community. And we pray too for those who mourn the loss of someone special. Let's just take a moment of quiet to remember somebody that we know particularly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and we say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples our Father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we've heard already something of that great prayer of the prophet Habakkuk. And Derek's going to introduce that and uh, give us those first three verses, first two verses of this prophet's third chapter. Thank you. And then we're going to introduce uh, Rick, and he's going to preach. This morning's uh, short reading is from Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And it's on page 942 uh, of the Pew Bibles, if you want to follow it. 
A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shiginoth. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In our wrath, remember mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'd like to invite uh, Rich to come forward and also Jan, who uh, is a member of his staff team there at All Saints, and it's very appropriate and you just uh, introduce him because you know him a lot better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Rich, who, um, for those of you that don't know, is the national leader of New Wine, having taken over from uh, Paul Harcourt earlier this year. Um, if you don't know, New Wine Ministries is a missional organisation that seeks to equip the local church to release confident, spirit-filled followers of Jesus. It's amazing. Um, they run a large summer conference as well that um, a number of us here have also been to. And as Joe said, he is my boss as well at All Saints. <laughs> so I have the privilege, honestly the privilege, of being part of the staff team at All Saints where Rich leads with real prophetic wisdom. So um, before he speaks, I'd just like to take the opportunity to pray for Rich. If that's okay. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing Rich here this morning. I pray your blessing on him. I pray that you would speak your word clearly through him, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to hear your message. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jan. Good morning. Good morning. It's a real joy to be with you. Um, I hear great things about you from Jan and from Dave, and it's always fun then to actually come and see people in real life. So um, it's great to be with you. And um, I'm privileged to have been asked to speak. Dave um, said, I really trust the pulpit to you. So um, <laughs> I, I, hopefully he'll be happy when he hears this in a few months' time. Um, I became the vicar of All Saints Worcester uh, nearly 14 years ago, uh, came in 2009, and one of the things I thought I'd do to help me, help me get my head around what on earth it was that I'd kind of found myself doing, I thought I'd go back and revisit some of the PCC minutes from the era before my time, actually before 2002 when All Saints was revitalized, uh, brought into renewal by my predecessor, Paul Swan. Um, so I went back into the kind of 1990s, and I really wished I hadn't. <laughs> uh, it was like a boring, slow death. But I found myself really fa fascinated, trying to understand what was going on. And I would suggest that simply what I was experiencing was a written form of a lot of mourning and moaning. <laughs> Lots of discontent at the state of the church, the way things were. And so now what we do, Every single time we gather as a PCC is we have a first item agenda, which is worship. And it's not songs, but we tell stories of what God is doing in our midst. To remind ourselves before we get into the stuff that a PCC meeting has to cover, why on earth we're talking about budgets or health and safety or safer recruitment. But also so that God willing, my uh, successors in years to come will read the minutes and go, oh my goodness. This was a community of people who took Jesus seriously, who believed that in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Spirit, they were entrusted with the kingdom of God, that they dared to believe that God could do something amazing in their time. And so with faith, they stretched their tent and they did amazing things. And so hopefully, there's a kind of an archive, a story of what God has been doing in our midst. You see, here's the thing. As much as we might like them, the kingdom of God does not advance through meetings and models and methods. There's one amen. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't advance through org charts and complex strategies and genius budgets. Like they're helpful. They create a framework in which mission and ministry can happen. They can release life, missional life in the context of a local church, but they can also squ squash the spirit. 
quench the spirit, restrict the people of God. It's always good to ask, are we more reliant on the spirit or our methods and our models and our meetings? Uh, Have a look through the uh, gospels, the early church accounts. You will struggle to find anywhere in there a five-year strategy. There were no building projects. There were occasionally some meetings, lots of prayer meetings, and every so often these big councils because they had to work out theological doctrinal issues. But most of the time, it tells the story of a bunch of ordinary people serving in an extraordinary God. And I want to talk this morning in the time I've got about what it means to be a community of people who pray for a move of the Spirit, and then when the Spirit moves, also move. Because when we pray big prayers, we've got to be willing to become the answer to our prayers. How does the kingdom advance if it's not methods and models and meetings? Well, I would suggest to you it's in moments and in movements. Big moments where God does something extraordinary in the midst of his people, like Pentecost, like those gathering moments you'll have had over the years where there are particular Sundays where actually you you can remember something happened, or when you gather for a church weekend away, or when you lean in in a particular way, for sure. But actually, most of the time, it's in little ordinary moments, daily moments of faithfulness and obedience as you seek holiness as you, not, you hear that nudge of the Spirit and you respond to it. As together, St. Andrew's Morven, you start to dream big for what might happen over the next few years. Ordinary moments made extraordinary by God because all those moments put together create something beautiful, which is why in the kingdom of God everyone gets to play. You don't make up the numbers, we need you. Everyone has at least one spiritual gift, You've got to use it for the glory of God until you die. So if you've not died, which I don't think you have, uh, you're on mission. And this really matters because actually people's lives are at stake here. So it's moments. And God, when he breathes on ordinary people in their moments, can create movements. Moves of the Spirit that happen every so often in church history. I came to faith in 1998, just as the Toronto Blessing, if you recall, that was in full flow. It was normal for me to go to church twice on a Sunday and to see the power of the Spirit poured out in extraordinary ways. People got healed all the time, delivered. People were getting saved left, right, and center. It was normal because the Spirit was moving in a particular way. He hasn't been doing that for a while, but I think, and more of this in a moment, something is brewing. So moves of the spirit, yes, but also movements of the church. New Wine is a movement. It's a bunch of ordinary churches, about 1,800, that dare to believe together that something can happen collectively as well as locally when we seek God. And it's a total privilege to find myself leading it. It was a big surprise. I keep expecting Michael McIntyre to appear from uh, left field. That I go, just kidding. You know, I actually had a better plan. But so far, no, I seem to be stuck with it. Now, it may not, have str- it may not have missed you or missed your attention that we are living through extraordinary times. We are living through the midst of cultural change, massive cultural change. It doesn't always feel like it in real time because we're just getting on with life. But actually, take a step back and think about what's happened over the last 30 years. And particularly in the last three years, the pandemic didn't cause any of the big cultural changes we're experiencing, but it certainly accelerated them. It certainly compounded them, and it definitely exposed them. But sociologists and cultural commentators in and outside of the church are talking about us moving from one cultural era into another. And these transitions, they take 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But we're living through the middle of what? We've gone from the Christian age into a secular age. I would argue we're now at the end of the secular age. The secular project, this attempt to do life post-World War II without God has not worked. And so you think about all the crises over the last few years that have meant the world becomes very unstable. Uh, All sorts of things have happened. Unpredictable political results, whether you voted for it or not. Brexit, Trump, uh, the Ukraine war, global financial uncertainty. It's all very disorientating and confusing and angst-inducing. Have you noticed that levels of anxiety have gone through the roof? particularly in young people. What is God up to? 
What's God doing? My friend Mark Sayers, who's a church leader in Australia and has written lots of great books, a real thinker on this stuff, he says this is what's going on. He says, Western culture is a failing, secularized revival, entering a moment of doubt. Secular revivalism, he says, fails because it wants progress without his presence, the kingdom without the king. In other words, culture, society around us in the Western world has tried to do the kingdom without Jesus. It's tried to progress into a kingdom-like future without God's presence. It's an attempt to revive the world as we all have our hearts longing for without Jesus. And it hasn't worked. And so there's this moment where actually there's a lot of doubt in the system. And we experience that, don't we? We feel that. And the moment where we're in, our, in at the moment, as the church, we might think, oh my goodness, it's a bit overwhelming. I, I feel disorientated. I don't really have any answers. I, I'm just here in Malvern. Like, I'm just going to walk up the hill. <laughs> like, it's a good thing to do, but then get at the top and pray, right? Just at the moment where the church is weary and overwhelmed and wondering whether the world around us wants us, I think the Spirit of God is saying to the church, now's your moment. Now's your moment, people. Because the people of God are really good at living in transition. We live between the kingdom now and the kingdom not yet. We live now, don't we, in this life ahead of that one. Always one eye on the horizon. Always looking for the return of Jesus and living into that future. We don't live here because it's our citizenship. We live here temporarily on behalf of the king and his kingdom. We're good at transition. We're good at ambiguity and paradox. If, if we do it in the power of the Spirit. So we're in a moment of change. And church history tells us that God never wastes a crisis. It's interesting if you go back and look at church history, and particularly the history of revivals and renewals, God always uh, moves powerfully in times of cultural crisis and change. Crisis always precedes renewal. It's not a guarantee of it. But wouldn't it be amazing in this time of cultural crisis to experience a move of the Spirit? Hello? I'm just trying to see whether you're up for this or not. (laughs) I think that's what God is doing, and there are signs. There is some spring rain. There are some spot fires where God's people are beginning to dare to believe again that God, in this time, you might, you might move again in power. Any of you heard about the Asbury Awakening that happened a couple of months ago? That was an extraordinary move of the Spirit, an ordinary bunch of people in a chapel service praying, and God just turned up, and they ushered him in beautifully, and they stewarded it really well. It's not a full-blown move of the Spirit. It's an awakening. It's a, it's a moment for the church to go, God's wanting in on our lives. And the question is, well, will we make room for that? So here's the question. How, if that's what God is doing, do we engage with that? And the short answer is this you have to have a holy discontent. A discontent with the way things are. Because you know that they are not as they're meant to be. And because you have faith to believe that God through his church could and is going to restore all creation unto himself. That there is better times ahead. That this is not it. And a belief that we have the answer in Jesus. But it's a holy discontent because it's easy to moan and mourn It's easy to complain about the state of the world around us and the church. It's easy to moan about this place, I'm sure. But actually, when it's turned into a holy discontent, it moves from being observations about to actually doing something about it. Holy discontent, which brings us to Habakkuk. He is um, this extraordinary prophet who's uh, often missed out because he comes right at the end of the Old Testament. You know, if you get to your Bible reading in a year thing, you kind of, you keep catching up with yourself, don't you? So, have you, do you ever do that? Where you kind of go, I'm just going to start where I'm meant to be. So you end up skipping the sort of last third of the Old Testament. But here he is, right at the end, three chapters. You can read it in 15 minutes. Amazing. One of my favorite prophets. And the context is very similar to ours. He's in a moment, uh, he's in, in Israel, and they're in a moment of cultural crisis. The people of God are kind of completely riddled with idolatry. They're going through the motions, complete lack of faithfulness. There's a faithful remnant people who still believe he's one of them they're in cultural crisis the Babylonian empire is all around them seeking to take over again 
There's this rising threat to them. And in the moment where he's finding himself, Habakkuk goes to God and speaks to him. Now, normally prophets come from God to speak to us, right? But here is Habakkuk going from the people to speak to God because he has a holy discontent. He's not happy with the way things are because he knows that they're not meant to be like that. They're meant to be better. And so he goes to God. And essentially, the whole of the book of Habakkuk is a poem or a psalm, and it's a lament psalm. And it's actually this two-way dialogue between God and Habakkuk. Habakkuk goes to him and says, essentially, God, what the heck? Like, look at the state of everything. And he asks God two questions in chapter 1 and then chapter 2. And God responds in chapter 1 and chapter 2 with these answers about explaining what's going on. And all of that leads Habakkuk then to get into this place where he thinks, okay, God, so what are you going to do about it? But he doesn't say that in a sort of like discontent, grumbly kind of way. He says, God, what are you going to do about it in the form of this prayer? In other words, he says, I have to take responsibility. I'm going to ask God to do what only God can do, but I have to first move towards God and offer myself in faith that I think God can do something amazing through us. He asks for God to move in power like he has done in the past. And I think the call on us is to be asking God in these days to move in power like he's done before. Because we can go and try and be the answer to the world's problems, and and we must and we should, and you are. But the danger is if it's not in the power of the Spirit, if it's not in sync with the leading of the Spirit, two things will happen. One, we'll rely on our methods and our models and our meetings and our strategy and our ultra and our plans. And number two, we might miss the very thing God's actually wanting us to do. Which is why at Pentecost, if you notice the early church, what do they say? What does Jesus say? Wait until the promised gift of the Spirit. In other words, if you try and do this on your own, you're just going to form a building committee. I know. Because that's what is in our instincts. So the danger is that we get ahead of ourselves. We need to pray. And so holy discontent, I hope you're hearing, is more than just recognizing that things are meant to be better or different. It's not just a frustration with the way things are, however holy that might be. It has to be a holy discontent that has two other things with it. Number one, a willingness to embrace change. (laughs) Da-da-da! And number two, a commitment to sustained prayer. A commitment to sustained prayer. Number one, a willingness to embrace change. Holy discontent it moves us to wanting to see a change and therefore being willing to be the change and to embrace change. If it's of God, then it's worth embracing, right? Now, about 15, 20 years ago, an American theologian who's since died called Phyllis Tickle wrote a great book. It's called The Great Emergence, and she says this. About every 500 years, the church feels compelled to hold a giant rummage sale, like a, like a car boot sale, like the one I drove past on the way here this morning. And she says, we are living in and through one of those 500-year sales. About every 500 years, the empowered structures of institutionalized Christianity, whatever they may be at that time, become an intolerable car- carapace, like a protective shell, that must be shattered in order that renewal and new growth may occur. In other words, what happens is we get quite comfortable and we create structures and systems with methods and models and meetings and org charts and plans and strategies. We do things the way we do and actually we can actually inoculate ourselves from the very thing that we're meant to be about, which is the presence of God and the call of the Spirit. And in this moment, she argued, 20 years ago, we're going through another great reformation. God is shaking and waking the church. And the danger for us, because we're full of the Spirit and we're informal, is we think we're the cutting edge. But there's more for us. And so my question for you, St. Andrews Mulvan, and I should say at this point, I have not had any conversation with Dave about what I'm going to say. He said, I just trust you. So if anything resonates, pray that it's prophetic. Okay, but my question as I prayed for you as a community is this, that I think there's a new season for you coming. I think there's a new season for you coming. I think it's going to be marked by two things. Growth. Growth among younger people. And it's not that you guys are just making up the numbers because young people need you. They're desperate for mentors and wisdom. Young couples need help with their marriages. Young families need help with parenting. So you guys, you're not dead. There's still work to do. So I think it's going to be marked by growth. 
But I also think, actually, it's going to be marked by quite a, uh, quite a lot of change. And I think you're going to have to be willing to embrace change. And I, I, I'm hoping you are. I'm, I'm guessing you are. I'm trusting you are. But the methods and the models and the meetings and all of those things that we like, maybe it'll be a season to hold those more lightly or even to put them down and to even ask God to do things in a different way. Interestingly, if we are off the map, if we are in uncharted territory, if we're in a new season in the world, in a new era, there is no map. We don't know where we are and we don't know where we're going. And so we can't really plan because we're kind of like in the wilderness. But we have a guide called the Holy Spirit who knows all things and is in all things and who will lead us and guide us and equip us. Does that make sense? We can only pursue God in the moments. Wouldn't it be great if you just committed yourselves to a whole load of moments? Create some moments of uh, fresh consecration, of saying, God, here we are. We believe there's a new season coming. It's going to be marked by growth, but also by change. And, and so we want to consecrate ourselves to you for that. Because we believe in these days you want to do something amazing. The second thing I said is that it has to come with a commitment to sustained prayer. Holy discontent is both given by God when you pray, but it can also be fueled by our prayer. Like to see as God sees. You know, we sometimes pray that, don't we? Break my heart for what breaks yours. So like God can put a holy discontent in you, it's a work of the Spirit. And if you're here this morning, some of you are going, I, I actually have a holy discontent. You've just named it for me. Thank you, Rich. And some of you might be here thinking, I don't, but I want it. Well, you can ask the Spirit to do that in you. So it's prayer-fueled. If you want to see God move in power, the only thing we can do to see that happen is to pray. Because it's always a sovereign act of the Spirit. But we can pray for and from a place of holy discontent for God to do what only God can do because any move of God is birthed in and sustained by the prayers of God's people always it's always birthed in prayer and it's always sustained by prayer and so the prayer of Habakkuk is the best one to pray and let's be clear it's not like you literally can only pray this prayer it's a format it's a template for prayer but notice what he says Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In anger, remember mercy. Just so a few things to notice. Lord, it's, we address our prayer to Jesus. I've heard of your fame. Have you heard of the stories of what God's done? Have you remembered your stories of what God has done in you? Once you weren't a follower of Jesus, now you are. That's the biggest one. But maybe you've got memories of the charismatic renewal of the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. Maybe you can tell those stories again. Re recall Jesus. Tell the God stories. Tell each other your God stories. It fuels prayer. Habakkuk knew the stories of the Old Testament that had gone before him. He knew them. He knew the stories of Exodus. That's primarily what he's got in his mind. But all those other moments, the rebuilding of the temple, he knows these stories of what God has done, and he's so committed to finding himself back in that place where he too experiences something of God's prayer. I stand in awe. I thought the way you led us, Joe, was so helpful. Literally standing in awe. Like, have you got awe and wonder permeating your spirituality? Are you lost in wonder and praise? Or are you a bit like, yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, Jesus, save you the world. I know him. <laughs> like, when have you last just been arrested in prayer or worship going, oh my goodness. Like, I'm invited to share eternity with God in a new heaven and a new earth. Really? And then he says, repeat them in our day. Like, do them again. Notice it's essentially an instruction. Okay, God, you said you've got a plan. Do it. Repeat them. But here's the key, in our day. Because you, you have no control over the next day, the next generation. But this season we're in, let's, let's ask for God to do it today. And we will in just a moment. I'm conscious I'm really going to be over time in a minute, so I'm just going to hurry up. Notice then, he says, repeat, so we repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. 
that is actually, the, in the original text, that is that other people would hear it. So it's not just like making it known to us, so repeat them in our day, that's for the people of God, and then that second line, uh, in our time, make them known, is so that the peoples of the world would know that you, oh God, are the one and true God. Wouldn't it be amazing to think that there's a move in the church of the Holy Spirit? that we come alive again in the things of God more fully, but also so that on a Sunday morning, you have to get here even earlier to find a car parking space because people are flocking to come here. Because why? Because God's power is being poured out. That's what I'm praying for, for you. And so the second thing that I'm, I want to say to you is that you, you, this is, season is going to be marked, sorry, the third thing about this season for you is going to be one about being cent, centered on prayer. I joined your prayer team earlier to pray for this guy. It's amazing. The prayers that were being prayed, they were big prayers. But we need your prayers added too. And here's the thing, you don't need a church prayer meeting to pray for this. You just need to get up in the morning. Like, and pray. But prayer meetings help, right? So get along to prayer meetings. I'm just gonna wrap up by suggesting a few things to you. So have you heard me? Number Three things that I think the Lord is saying potentially to you guys. Weigh it, test it. I'll share all of this with Dave. The first is that there's a new season coming that will be marked by growth, particularly young people. Second is that it's gonna require change. It's gonna be an invitation to learn to live off the map. And for all of us, I think it's true for all of us, but particularly it'll look specifically in a certain kind of way for you to hold things lightly. And the third thing is it will be marked by an increase in the central place of prayer because prayer is the key. Do you hear that? Great. Interestingly, if you look in church history, what happens is when you have cultural crisis in the world and holy discontent in the church, you have the potential for renewal and for revival. And that's what I'm praying for, that we'd see extraordinary things in these days. Church history... Is, our, is a good guide for what might come ahead. There are four stages to revival. Real quick, here they are. The first, as I've talked about, is this holy discontent among the people of God, which leads to number two, God's people praying and trusting in his promises. That's the prayer of Habakkuk, etc., which is what we've just been talking about. And then what happens if God chooses to breathe on us as he can and often does is that we see an outpouring um, of the Holy Spirit we see his glory and his presence and his power. And then, as I've just said, we would see people responding to God. That's how I came to faith. God got hold of me. But I'm pretty sure it's because a whole load of people were praying. There's a whole generation of us in the late 90s that came to faith. Many of us are now church leaders. It's very interesting. And finally then, just to encourage you, here are three things that in every single revival in church history, they have found. Interesting, isn't it? They've done the survey, loads of it. If you're interested in the book, I can give you a recommendation. What's happening? Um, every revival has three common features. God uses unlikely people. We tend to think, don't we, well, it's going to happen in London, probably, or that big church up in Birmingham, gas something. <laughs> They're my friends, I'm joking. I, like, I, I know what it's called. But actually, that's not how it works. The Toronto Blessing started at Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship, which was a little church on the side of Toronto by the airport. Why there? They prayed. There was a holy discontent. So they started praying. It's amazing. And all sorts of exciting things. I think the Spirit's taken over because he wants me to finish. <laughs> so um, uh, there's always a base church or multiple churches. It's always in a church. And intercessory prayer is at the heart of it. Every revival, every move of the Spirit, those three things. So here's the question. Why not St. Andrew's Malvern? Ordinary people, holy discontent, the power of the Spirit, anything could happen. So it's really over to you in a moment. I love this quote from Andrew Murray who says this, the coming revival, oh, it stopped. Oh, here we go. Uh, <laughs> the coming revival must begin with a great revival of prayer. It is in the closet with the door shut that the sound of abundant, the abundance of rain will first be heard. One of the reasons that Habakkuk prayed that prayer, and I finish with this, is that back in the beginning of the letter, or the, sorry, the poem, the psalm, uh, God responds to him, his initial complaint with these words, and it put faith in Habakkuk to keep seeking God. 
This is the promise of God. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. Habakkuk's not going to God thinking, well, I kind of think maybe he might listen to this prayer. He's going in complete confidence because God's already said, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. Are you up for that? Great. If you're able, would you stand? There'll be an opportunity for uh, personal prayer ministry after the service is finished with the prayer of blessing. And I'd love uh, you to come to the front at that point. Uh, in fact, I think we said earlier, just come during that, the last song in a moment, but and we'll pray for you. If, if you have or want a holy discontent, uh, it actually often means stepping out and moving, embracing some change, looking a bit foolish, although everyone will be going, great. So in, in my mind, you're all going to come to the front right? Because I'm hoping you've all like got a desire for holy discontent. But I recognize that doesn't always work like that. So some of you will want to come to the front and be just uh, offer yourselves and have someone lay hands on you, God's blessing on you. We'll do that, as I say, during the last song and after that. But let's just take a moment collectively, shall we, to be still. And you might find it helpful to close your eyes. I always find it helpful to put my hands out, like a posture of openness, empty-handed, humility before God. And whatever words are helpful in your head, just to say, God, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. And I look at the state of the world. And I look at the state of the church. And then I look at what the scriptures say and there's a disconnect and my heart breaks And I want God to see you do something amazing in these days of change and crisis. And so here I am. Put in me, God, if it's not there already, holy, holy discontent. a sense of expectation and faith that you could do something extraordinary in us and through us in these days. Maybe you're someone who quite likes the methods and the models and the meetings, but you know the nudge of the Spirit is, yeah, just hold them lightly. Maybe it's been a while since you had a moment God, here we are. And just like Habakkuk, we're standing before you saying, God, please, please do again in this day, in these days, in this time, what you've done before for us and for the world. And the invitation is to Say yes to embracing change. And say yes to increasing your commitment to prayer. The two things we can do. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. God's speaking to some of you, I'm sure. Putting maybe re- rekindling dreams, putting ideas in your head. And I think for some of you, just reminding you, yeah, you're still on the team. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to sing a final song now, but. As I said earlier, if if during this song or after you particularly want prayer for this, you want to respond, you you may just want to come and find some space at the front and kneel 
as a sort of sign of surrender again to the things of God. You know, here I am, God, use me. There may be particular things that are going on for you that have got nothing to do with the talk and you want to get prayed for for that. Or a particular response to what I've said. Don't wait for someone else. Like someone always has to go first, right? But you're welcome to come and the team will come and pray for you. Bless you. amazing grace the grace that never runs out the love that never fails do Lord what only you can do among us we pray and now to him who by the power at work within us is able to do immeasurably more immeasurably more than anything we can ask or think or even imagine the glory 
in the church and in Christ Jesus that he might be lifted up and seen for who he is across this nation. To him be glory forever and ever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and Spirit be upon you now and remain with you and those whom you serve and those whom whose lives will be changed through your prayers now and always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. We're going to be around at the front to continue to pray for people as you'd like to. There's coffee in the hall. Let's continue just to worship very quietly. Let's